We're being told to keep things clean. Be it through direct contact or through the air, traces of coronavirus can be transferred to the objects we touch and in turn, transferred to us. To keep that from happening, we've come up with innovative ways to avoid having to touch things and to keep surfaces clean. But living our lives means it's impossible to avoid all types of contact. So we need to understand the real risks in our environments. How long does the virus remain viable on surfaces? And is it ever there in dangerous amounts? Do surfaces pose the threat we once thought they did? And this is DW's COVID-19 special. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stephen Beardsley in Berlin. It's good to have you with us. Money, shopping carts, door handles, just about everything we touch is getting a second look these days, or even a clever workaround like that elevator we just saw. But are our anxieties over surface contacts backed up by the research into the virus and its viability? Let's take a look. Weaving in and out among the commuters at London St Pancras is this futuristic pair. They've been brought in by one of the British capital's busiest railway stations to help with the fight against coronavirus. While one sweeps and mops, the other uses powerful ultraviolet light to kill microorganisms, including those that cause COVID-19. Keeping coronavirus off the station surfaces is a constant battle. What the new technology will allow us to do is have our staff focusing on the high touch points so that the automatic machines can then go and clean the mundane areas um, and that allows us to ensure that we're doing exactly what we need to do in the, say, in the current climate. Scientists have been trying to work out how long the virus remains active on surfaces. Researchers in Australia recently tested its survival when left in ideal conditions. The virus is suspended into a, an artificial uh, matrix that resembles uh, human secretions. Um, we then um, placed a droplet of that virus onto the surface, allowed it to dry, and then incubated it for up to 28 days at 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and 40 degrees. And then we sampled at regular points to see if we can recover any live virus. The scientists concluded that coronavirus can remain infectious on surfaces such as glass, steel and polymer banknotes when kept at 20 degrees Celsius for at least four weeks. That's more or less room temperature. However, move up to 30 degrees and the virus survives for just seven days. At an even higher temperature, 40 degrees Celsius, it remains infectious for just 24 hours. The researchers are, however, keen to point out that outside of their strictly controlled lab conditions, coronavirus may find it a lot harder to survive. In the real world, um, those surfaces are likely to be um, in contact with sunlight. Uh, there will also be different humidities, different temperatures. So the real world um, results would likely be shorter than what we were able to show. The amounts of virus used in the study are also likely to be much greater than would be encountered in the real world. Nevertheless, global health officials have taken note of the findings. Uh, can you hear me? We use this information um, to look at our disinfectants. The good news is that this virus can be disinfected uh, with, with disinfectants, with chlorine, with different types of, very, very quickly. And that's where the St Pancras robots come in. Through their work, and that of their human colleagues, the station stands a better chance of stopping the virus in its tracks. And I'm joined now by Emmanuel Goldman. He's professor of microbiology at Rutgers University in the US. Emmanuel, it's good to have you with us. Um, this Australian study that we just mentioned in that piece, does it tell us anything relevant for normal people about how they should interact with their environments? Uh, no, I do not believe so. The conditions that they used for these experiments were just completely out of touch with reality. Uh, it's as if the the, the scientists uh, sat down and said, "What? What can? How can we devise a way to protect this virus as long as possible? What can we do to extend its lifetime?" That, that's what they were doing. For example, they did their study in the dark. 
Uh, that is, the virus was kept in the dark. The virus is killed by light, ultraviolet light. You've you already mentioned that in your broadcast. Uh, all light has some, some component of ultraviolet. Um, they uh, used uh, a material in, in the uh, virus preparation uh, that they were aiming to imitate human secretions. But they used something called bovine serum albumin. Bovine stands for cow. Uh, this is a protein from cow, cows, and uh, it's already been published that bovine serum albumin protects the virus and mm. prevents it from decaying. Um, the virus is killed by being dried out. They uh, did their experiment in 50% humidity. Now that's a, a relatively normal humidity in, indoors, but humidity is a variable. It doesn't always stay at that uh, percent, And it turns out that 50% humidity is the maximum humidity for the virus survival. Um, All right, when the so virus this... dies, uh, dries out, it dies. So I was going to say the study, it looks like um, it got a lot of attention, obviously, because of um, this, this figure of over 28 days survivability. What do we know about the actual survivability of the virus under normal conditions? Everybody else who's looked at it, <laughs> and, and include, including many papers that I have criticized, find much, much less survival of the virus on surfaces. Um, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, found uh, a couple of days. Um, other papers have found uh, comparable. Um, in actual human mucus, the virus survives of a half-life of three hours. What we mean by a half-life is that after a set amount of time, half the virus is dead and half remains. And then same amount of time again, half of what was left at that point is gone and half remains or a quarter is left. So you do the math and you go through four, five, six half lives and you're down mm. to much, much lower levels of virus. Um, and the uh, half life uh, that most people have measured in, on paper, it's in the order of uh, an hour or two, maybe three hours in, in the New England Journal of Medicine paper. Mm. And plastic and steel, that paper had about a six-hour half-life. Do um, you think people are overly so, concerned about uh, surface transmission, that, that basically they're, they're more worried than they should be? Yes, they, yes, I do believe that. They are uh, definitely more, more concerned than they should be. The main concern should be in what you breathe. This virus is contracted by breathing. It's not contracted by surfaces. And, and theoretically, you can get it from a surface. There is no case confirmed in the scientific literature where this virus has been transmitted by a surface. Um, there are two possible papers that suggest it, but even there, it could just as well have been transmitted by aerosols, by the air that you breathe. For instance, this is a study in South Korea, uh, a case in South Korea, where there was a, a mixed-use building of offices and residences of about 1,100 people in the building. One of the businesses in that building, uh, people got sick with the coronavirus, uh, and everybody in that office got sick. The rest of the building, almost nobody got sick. Hmm. And if there had been surface transmission, we would have seen a lot more in that case. Briefly, um, if I may ask, uh, we just saw in the piece there about cleaning solutions, like these robots that go around a station and disinfect. Do you think that's helpful, or is that just for peace of mind? Is it a gesture? Briefly, if you can. I, th I think it's, uh, it's peace of mind. It's, it's uh, just a gesture. Again, the, 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 the problem with focusing on surfaces is that it takes your focus away from what really is important, which is what you breathe. All right. Emmanuel Goldman, we'll have to leave it there. Professor Emmanuel Goldman at Rutgers University, thank you so much. Thank you. And now it's time for your questions. It's the part of the show where our science correspondent, Derek Williams, answers the questions you've posted to our YouTube channel. Over to Derek. How long does an asymptomatic person or one who has overcome COVID-19 remain a possible source of infection? Regardless of whether you have symptoms or if you're asymptomatic, um, if you've been diagnosed with COVID-19, it's important 
not to leave isolation until your local health authority says you no longer pose a danger to others. Um, in its recommended guidelines, the WHO says that on average, positive patients who show symptoms could be infectious for up to 10 days after symptoms first appeared. Um, it also says patients should wait at least that long, plus three days after they're symptom free without any medication. So a person with an average case of COVID-19, if there is such a thing, um, should isolate a minimum of 13 days. Um, for asymptomatic people, the WHO recommendation is to isolate for at least 10 days since your last positive test. Um, various national health authorities have interpreted those recommendations in different ways. Um, there's no zero risk scenario, but as a rule of thumb, people who test positive, whether they're, they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, are now viewed as being no longer infectious um, after two weeks. Our science correspondent, Derek Williams there. And before we let you go, we're all still learning how to incorporate social distancing into our routines. Well, here's a school in Italy that's found a novel way to bring children to class while staying safe. With a so-called petty bus or foot bus, that's basically a rope with distance handles, the children wear face masks and pull their book bags alongside. And the system was originally designed to limit air pollution from cars, but has been updated for the coronavirus era. And that's it for today's COVID-19 special. As always, thanks for watching.